Welcome everyone to What is Black, a parenting podcast that addresses issues important to raising healthy and thriving Black children and teens. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Duje, a Black pediatrician, writer, speaker, and mom. Today's episode launches our third season. Can you believe it? I'm so excited for this season and all the great guests that will join us in conversation. During 2020, we entered a new era, the era of COVID-19. This era was a catalyst for calls for social and racial justice and discussions about the role of systemic racism within institutions such as education, healthcare, criminal justice, environment, and politics that led to health and social inequities within Black and Brown communities. This season, our theme is Normal Didn't Work. How can we reimagine these systems and institutions to better serve families raising Black children and teens and achieve racial and social justice and equity? For this episode, we're discussing Black children, youth, and education in the era of COVID-19. We're joined by guest Aaliyah Swaby, public education reporter for the Texas Tribune to discuss her article, Many Texas Families Say Remote Learning Isn't Working and They Want It Fixed. Then I talk with Dr. Valerie Adams Bass, a developmental psychologist and assistant professor at the Department of Human Services at the University of Virginia Curry School of Education about a policy statement that she co-authored addressing inequities in education, considerations for black children and youth in the era of COVID-19. Welcome, Aaliyah, um, to the podcast. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to welcome um, everyone to the podcast and our special guest, Aaliyah Swaby. She's a public education reporter for the Lex- for the Texas Tribune. And as I was um, talking to Aaliyah before, before our conversation, this, this, ep- this episode is one of um, 10 episodes this, this season where I really want to have this through line of, of really talking about how can we reimagine opportunities for, for Black children um, and youth given this intersection of COVID-19 and, and structural racism, right? How can we really work to improve our systems for that, that serve kids? And Aaliyah had this wonderful article, um, many, many Texas families say remote learning isn't working and they they want it fixed. So remote learning has really been um, has had a disproportionate um, effect on um, families of color, especially um, Black children um, and youth of color and, and, and Black families. So I wanted to um, invite Aaliyah to have a conversation about her article and, you know, and we can kind of think about, you know, based on her her understanding and her her research and, and conversations, how can we really reimagine um, systems for kids? So, um Long-winded way to welcome Aaliyah. And so we'll dive right into the conversation. So Aaliyah, my first question for you is, um, in the article, you know, you pointed out that remote learning has exacerbated existing disparities for low-income students and students of color. And I was just wondering, what what were some of your um, findings about the main reasons for this exasper- exacerbation? Yeah, so I think the, the pandemic in general has illuminated and exacerbated existing disparities for those students. Uh, We know that their communities have been hit harder by COVID-19. They're dying at disproportionately higher rates compared to um, white Texans. And even before the pandemic, they were at a disadvantage uh, in the wealth gap because of systemic racism. And the economic downturn has exacerbated that. Um, Black and Hispanic Texans are more likely to live below the poverty line and struggle with housing and food insecurity, um, not have health insurance or not have access to stable internet. Um, And so when you add a pandemic to the mix, that uh, makes everything harder. So I I wrote in the article, um, we did an analysis um, of, uh, you know, how students were making that decision to stay home, how, how families were making that decision. And we found that majority Black, Hispanic, and low-income school districts had a majority of students who were choosing remote learning. And so when, as I pointed out in the piece, the state doesn't prepare for remote learning, doesn't give school districts time or resources to properly prepare for remote learning, it's going to disproportionately impact students who are already vulnerable, whether or not that was their intent. 
you know, to, to me, this is like so, you know, so important because as a, you know, as a pediatrician, as well as a, as a public health doc, you know, in my, in my career, you know, these are what we all call social determinants, social determinants of health, right? Mm. What are those, what are those things, you know, where kids either live, play, grow, um, worship, right? What those systems, those, that community that really impact and provide opportunities or disadvantages, right? Um, inequitable disadvantages for children. And I think, you know, you spoke so, you know, this article, you know, kind of sums up all those effects, right? Um, not having access to to resources and disproportionately um, impacting impacting communities of color and low income families, right? So typically, you know, a lot of researchers might say, oh, um, you know, this population, you know, is disadvantaged, right? And so it's sort of racial, it's in, put in a racialized, you know, sense of mm-hmm. you know why that why are there disproportionalities, why are there these gaps? And I think what your article does so well in highlighting is that it's not about race, right? It's about what are um, what are the policies? What are the structures in place that really either afford afford advantages for certain people and at the same time disadvantage right disadvantage other communities? Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think a lot of times when we talk about disproportionate impact, um, the meaning of that can get lost. Right. Like if people, if readers don't know the history, um, they have a hard time understanding why. Um, that disproportionate impact is due to systemic racism or, you know, what that means about the the history of, um, you know, the state or the country in, uh, you know, pursuing policies that made sure that certain people didn't have access and how that relates to how they're doing today. Um, I think, you know, that that history can just get lost unless you really break it down for people. And so that's, what I've been trying to do in my reporting in general, but also in this story, um, you know, I wanted to lay out the steps of here is how the state, you know, over the summer just did not choose to plan for something that, you know, a lot of their their students, their most vulnerable students ended up choosing, um, you know, which is remote learning. Yeah. And, and again, I think it was a hard choice for many parents, right? If in many states, there were opportunities for hybrid models, and, and my understanding, Texas, um, many st- Texas school districts did have hybrid models. Parents mm-hmm. would either, like you said, choose to go in school, you know, be in person or virtual. Mm-hmm. You know, and in Maryland, where I live, again, it depended on if it's a public school in the school district. So even though you know your article focuses on Texas, it really is a is a model of what has occurred throughout the country, right? Many, and then also being in private, private practice and talking to families that who've, ha- who've had to make the choice um, or the choice was made for them, you know, cause their schools were, their schools were closed. Mm-hmm. So they had to do virtual learning there. There has been an impact right on many families. Um, and, you know, yeah. And, but, but I know from talking to some families that I work with, um, it's been, you know, advantageous for some families, you know, their kids that have, th- who have really thrived um, with virtual learning. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, I think uh, probably more kids who, you know, it's not really worked out for them. Yes, definitely. But in having that conversation, knowing that there are two sides to the discussion, right? There are some kids who have done well and some kids who, who are probably better served in in-person settings. You know, I just want to talk to you a little bit more about um, how can we really reimagine, right? Is there an opportunity here? I know that there have been a lot of challenges and a lot of a lot of this did not work very well and systems are are trying to um, rectify that. But in, in trying to do that moving forward, what are some thoughts you think about reimagining how systems, our educational system can better serve um, children of color? Yeah, so this is something I've been uh, meaning to work on as a as a follow up story. So I appreciate the question. I uh, spoke with more than thirty people for this article, including teachers and school superintendents and students, parents, and experts. And one thing they said they wish state leaders would understand is this is not a normal time. Stop pretending this is normal. Everyone is struggling in some way or another. Um, you know, even even the the families where it's remote learning is working for them that the pandemic generally is is hard on everyone. Um, And so business as usual is actually harmful. And then another thing they said was, you know, business as usual already was not working. 
Um, so one one example, one thing I've been thinking about is um, access to technology. Um, you know, a state report came out the other day that um, quantified what a lot of people in under-resourced schools already knew, that even in districts that have had adequate technology before the pandemic, that technology was not being distributed equitably across their schools. So some schools maybe had extra money to to buy technology and others just didn't. And so their kids didn't have, um, you know, the computers and the the iPads or or whatever they needed. Um, And, uh, you know, maybe a kid across the street, you know, in in the district would have, you know, multiple devices per kid. Um, I spoke with a, a member of the State Board of Education for the story whose fifth grade children don't have access to internet because they live in rural Texas. Um, on the border. And they're using paper packets right now um, with material from last year, and they probably will have to redo a grade. Um, So I think, I I really hope that, you know, now that the the state has kind of rushed and and put, you know, $900 million in to get hotspots and devices and computers for schools, um, they still haven't fully achieved equity. You know, there's still kids who don't have the things that they need to learn. But Hopefully it's it's put it's lit a fire <laughs> under um, you know education officials to to actually understand what true equity requires and then you know commit to addressing it no matter what um, and to to understand the realities their students are living in and then address them and, and plan for the future um, which requires an ongoing financial investment and an ongoing commitment to you know actually ask families what they need in order to be successful. And what I found so interesting is that, you know, again, you interviewed both families, educators, right, you know, across mm-hmm. the across the spectrum, you know, kind of give this like 360 view of the experiences of families. Mm-hmm. And what's so interesting is that many of the teachers themselves are, you know, are having living this dual experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so they're parenting and they're working. And at the same time, they have um, their work, their work is really structured on trying to help other families um, through this educational process. And so I, I can, I can, I can appreciate um, the struggles that they've been going through as well. So, and I, and I think you've done a great job of kind of showing that whole, that whole spectrum. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important not to, I think there's been a lot of rhetoric kind of, pitting teachers against students, or at least the interests of teachers against the interests of students when it comes to reopening. Um, And I think that that really isn't true. I mean, I talk to a lot of parents who are teachers. Um, I've talked to a lot of parents, um, including those in in majority Black and Hispanic and low-income districts who consider their teachers to be part of their community and you know, the, the first line basically that, that they communicate with in their schools um, and they're invested in their safety. Um, and teachers in the schools really, you know, don't want to be responsible for passing this virus to their students or, or their family members. So I really think it's, um, you know, it, it's more complicated than teachers versus students. And I hope, you know, more people, um, you know, especially those pushing for specific policy decisions, reconsider the way that they're framing this. So that's a very good, you know, it's kind of like a nice segue into my next question. So I just wanted to ask you, what do you think, um, will will there be opportunities for more collaboration among boards of education, educators, families, and students um, post-COVID-19, you think? I I really hope so. I mean, I think the problem is that um, in Texas and in across the country, COVID-19 has unfortunately been politicized. Um, and so at, at local levels, that means, you know, there are definitely parents who are happy with how their districts are handling this, but there are also parents who feel like they're not getting what they need. Um, there are some parents who are choosing, you know, other opportunities to educate their kids, including, you know, pulling their kids out and homeschooling them or, or, or choosing private school. Um, you know, I, I think that there there's also a, a racial element to that. You know, there are um, there are is a, a small like subset of, of white parents in some districts who have been pretty vocal um, about wanting schools to be reopened at all costs and, and not really, you know, wanting a remote option um, for kids, despite the fact that, you know, we know that 
a lot of um, Black and Hispanic families have actively chosen remote learning. And so you see these, um, you know, these fractures in local communities. I think that there's also a lot of mistrust right now. Um, you know, administrators and, and teachers have been in, in some districts, in some places, um, really unable to trust each other. Um, you know, teachers have not necessarily been happy about how their administrators have handled health and safety during the pandemic. I think that, you know, in once the once the immediacy of the pandemic is gone, I, I hope that there can be, you know, a common understanding of, you know, some of the problems that were illuminated and, and you know, a, a movement forward to address those on a local level. I do think in some ways that it depends on the school district and its its local policies and its local politics. I think another thing that was um, illustrated in the in the article was that education in itself is not a silo, right? So the kids, you know, live in an interconnected world, right? Education is connected to their home, community, and health. Mm. And as you were as you were talking about, um, you know, policies, I'm hoping as well that when when there are policy considerations, right, that there's a more holistic view of um, how policies are impacting kids and their educational outcomes or their, you know, educational experience, you know, knowing that, again, like you talked about, hopefully in the future, technology is going to really play an important role, right? Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking, you know, even in my community, um, I live in, in Maryland, you know, I don't, you know, I don't have access to like the, you know, the highest um, internet connection, so, I mean, I, it, it works, right? But sometimes, you know, I'll lose connection. Like even if I'm recording a podcast, sometimes I'll lose connection because right. either my son, you know, my, my kids are, um, are taking their college classes. My husband's working from home. So, so I just wanted to kind of talk to you about why it was important to incorporate um, and really, really highlight that interconnectedness, right? It's not just an educate, it's not just the educational aspect, right? Mm-hmm. The kids in school and not in school, there are other aspects to this whole discussion. Right. Yeah, I I started reporting this article because uh, I was getting messages on Twitter from high school students across the state who really wanted me to know why they were failing classes. I had written an article before just saying, you know, I I was hearing from school superintendents that the um there were a lot more remote learners who were failing classes than um than before. And so, uh, you know, they reached, these students reached out to me. And when I talked to them, I heard a lot about um, their mental health, their stress about the adults in their lives. You know, maybe their, their families were, um, you know, they had lost jobs or, or had other economic issues. Um, I heard about the other responsibilities on their plate. Some of them were working outside of the home to help pay for college, um, especially the high schoolers. And so I realized after talking to them um, how important it was to include and, and really forefront that context in the story. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that it's not a normal year for students, um, even though there are some who are succeeding in remote learning. For a lot of others, not being connected to their schools and, and their support systems have made things a lot more difficult, especially during a pandemic. So I wanted readers to understand the weight of those burdens for for those students. Um, so I, I wasn't talking about their failures without also talking about, you know, everything else that, that connected to that. You know, I think when you, when you hear it in context, you realize the failing grades are really the, the least important part of that, right? Like if a student is struggling with their mental health, struggling with suicidal ideation, um, you know, their, their life is more important than their grades in the, in the short term. And I think, um, that's what we, you know, that's what I, I think I've heard from a lot of, of different uh, people that I interviewed is, you know, in saying this is not a normal year, I think they also meant, you know, it is dangerous to pretend that this is a normal year when so many people are, you know, really struggling and, and at the end of, of their rope in a lot of cases, um, including, you know, teachers and including parents and, and students. Oh, I think, yeah, context matters, right? I think... I think if anything, this past year has really, really illuminated, um, I think, issues that educators have already known, right? Because mm. I have I have, co- I have one colleague who, and, and I've seen this um, on 
in different present you know presentations professional presentations mm-hmm. of it's a it's a comic of this kid coming into school laden with you know the weight of everything in their life right so so when kids show up to school they're not just showing up you know to to read write and and learn arithmetic right mm-hmm. they're showing up with everything that they bring from home from the community and I, and, and I think that's an Im- important thing to highlight that when we talk about educational equity, we're really not just focusing on education, right? There's, there really needs to be a, this broader understanding of what kids bring, what families bring, what educators have to really contend with, you know, homelessness, mm-hmm. um, food insecurity, like you said, the economics, I mean, this and mental health is so much that... Um, that has to be taken into account when we look at how do we really address educational equity for kids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I would hope that more people are really more aware of that than before. I think, you know, educators have, have been aware of that, especially if they're working in, you know, title one schools or, or um, other schools where they, they see those kids every day and they really, they understand, but I think it's a matter of everyone getting on the same page of, okay, what are you going to do about it now? (laughs) You know, how are you going to actually address that um, both within the education system and outside of it? Oh, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that is the, that is the ultimate question. Mm -hmm. How is the Texas school system looking to address educational equity um, given the experiences of this past fall with COVID-19? So the the state is uh, trying to get, Uh, schools to give teachers more time to plan and and build planning time into their normal schedules, um, which would be helpful, I think, for uh, for the teachers who I've heard from where they just feel like, you know, they have absolutely no time to plan. There's there's, you know, more tasks than ever. And and they're just really burnt out right now. So I think that might improve things for them. Um, They're also the state is also saying they're going to, you know, address uh, addressing disparities among students and, and investing in teachers. Um, they, they haven't released specifics about how they're going to do that, um, down the line, but they're, um, you know, they're, they're working on it. But one of the the main things I want to focus on that Texas has done is allow school districts to bring students who are failing classes or repeatedly absent back to school in person. So what that means is, you know, it could mean a lot of children in Black, Hispanic, or low-income families who made the decision, um, maybe for reasons of health, to keep their kids home, um, are are going to be forced to return. Um, and sometimes they they might be forced to return to schools that are open in areas with high community spread, especially now that you know there's a surge not just in Texas but um, in a lot of places across the country. Um, A lot of the districts that are considering doing that now are small and and rural, but I think we're going to see some of the bigger districts um, considering doing the same. Um, And and I want to stress, too, that medical experts don't recommend that. I mean, they recommend giving giving families a a choice. Um, And, you know, at least one study found that reopening schools in areas with more community spread does uh, spread the virus. I think we we just don't know what that impact is, and so you know, to to make that decision for families um, is not something that you know, medical experts recommend. Um, and I think that you know, in in Texas, we've seen high community spread for months now, including a lot of the urban and suburban areas where most of the state's Black, Hispanic, and low income students are are learning. Um, Texas, I think, thinks of this as a way to help improve remote learners' grades and and help with their absences. And they think it's going to be a positive for their education. But I think, you know, that really remains to be seen, um, especially with what we've talked about um, around, uh, you know, mental health and all the other factors that go into whether a student is having a good educational experience um, you know, if if a family is feeling kind of forced back into a decision, um, and a student is is feeling that way too, I think it it definitely has the potential to do more harm than good. But it the impact of it remains to be seen. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think everything, you know, that we've talked about today really is, you know, thinking about how do we forecast, right? Um, using the data that we have, using the experiences that um, that many families have, have expressed and educators have expressed. And I hope, I mean, I, I hope what Texas is planning does does make a positive impact on families. But like you said, you know, and, and you alluded to, you know, really weighing choice that parents have and, and, and are they allowing parents some input into the decision making? And I think, you know, that's, I think that definitely that conversation we had earlier about what are those opportunities for really collaborating with families, mm -hmm. having this holistic um, communication about um, what's best for, best for kids and not having, you know, not having the opinions or taking into account um, the feelings and and concerns of parents, I think is, you know, is will be will definitely have an impact mm -hmm. on whatever outcome um, any educa educational system is looking to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And I I thank you so much for this conversation, mm -hmm. Aaliyah. You know, I know we can't answer all the questions, but I think it's important that we bring to light that there yeah. are, you know, there are things that can be done. And there are opportunities, despite what's, you know, what's been a hard year and what will probably continue to be um, a difficult year as we transition um, from COVID to to the new, to this new reality, this new normal. And I thank you so much for highlighting mm -hmm. um, this important topic. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you. For the second half of this conversation, we'll be speaking with Dr. Valerie Adams-Bass. So welcome, Dr. Adams-Bass, um, to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and talk with you today. I am, I am, I am so honored um, that you joined us. Because I mean, you you have like this this rich background, right? So I definitely wanted to um, to pick your brain a little bit about this this particular episode where we're where I'm really focusing on Black children, youth, and education in the era of COVID nineteen, and also the fight for racial justice. So I wanted to um, ask you first if you can just provide an overview of your work in education and how the era of COVID nineteen has impacted Black children and youth from your perspective. Absolutely. I'll try to do my best to be rich, but brief. So I started out as a practitioner working in out of school time programming, mentoring programming, and consistently found that the models that were being used either had a deficit approach to working with black children and families, or they were just a void of cultural context. So informally, I began researching and trying to determine how best to work with black children and the educators who support them and their families. And through that process, I actually went on to pursue my PhD. So I'm an applied psychologist, a developmental psychologist, should I say. And I like to consider myself an applied researcher because I did start out as a practitioner. And when I'm involved in research, I, I like to be able to write in academic arenas, but also in practical arenas where teachers and parents and counselors and clinicians can pick up and use that research. So what I really focused on and began to get excited about was racial socialization and racial identity experiences and how to support Black children in school spaces where they are often othered or there are assumptions and low expectations about them. Um, and so how do we give them the supports that they need to thrive in these environments where oftentimes um, things are inequitable? How do we also support the teachers and educators who work with them so that they have a better understanding, cultural content, cultural competency, so that they can do a better job and have high standards with for working with Black children and youth, and also how do you connect with their parents? So my work really focuses on Black adolescent youth, primarily American, but I've also done some work with what we call late stage adolescents or young adults when I was living and teaching in Southern Africa. So I do that. And then more recently, I began to look at media images. Media has exploded. We've moved beyond TV. We've moved beyond cable to you know, smart watches, smartphones, uh, advertisements across buses and trains and planes and automobiles and social media. And lots of the racial content 
off the negative and stereotypes have have moved right into these new social media platforms and traditional media platforms so that I'm also interested in how do young people interpret these media images or stereotypes about Black people? And also, how are the adults who see these images of Black people interpreting them and then responding to the young people that they serve as teachers or clinicians and other professionals? Oh, man, you, you're, doing, you're doing great, great work. But I'm, I think, again, for, you know, especially for this episode, right, everything has, you know, has really changed, right, since COVID-19, right? So I don't even know if I remember what happened before COVID-19, right? Right. Before March, <laughs> right. Before, before March 2020, like, I mean, I have like glimpses, right? So it feels like it's a dream, <laughs> like that prior to March 2020. So, you know, knowing the work that you've done prior to COVID-19, right? Mm-hmm. How how has COVID-19 really impacted how you see your work moving forward or even some of the needs that you're seeing moving forward? Very good question. So I'm going to say I always thought my work was the most important research, <laughs> quite honestly, the most important research, the most important practice for Black children and families. And what COVID has done for, for all of us, particularly early on up until, let's say, the summer of 2020, when, when the, the country really began to reopen, because of Black Lives Matter, because of the police brutality and brutality by normal everyday citizens against Black people, during COVID, everything was shut down. So the American gaze, in fact, the global gaze was on what's happening in America. And what that did, what COVID has done, is elevate disparities in education, income, employment, uh, medical care, all of neighborhood composition, resources, quality food, quality shopping experiences that Black people and children have traditionally experienced. And it's not a conversation that, that's new to researchers and practitioners like myself and, and probably you as well, Jackie, being a pediatrician and working with children and, and their parents. But now everybody's paying attention, not just the people who've been advocating and doing their work and doing their research like myself. And so it has elevated those disparities and inequities and forced school districts out of school time, even colleges to wrestle with these systemic inequities and racial structures that really don't provide an equitable opportunity for Black children and youth. So in terms of thinking about my research and what has happened is it has elevated the research I do, particularly when I write a piece that pulls from my academic research and puts it into a practical conversation or space. Like, what do I do with this research as a parent? What I do with this research as a teacher And also, it's helped to really come up with suggestions for how to create policies that are going to address these inequities. So when I think about the SRCD, we created, there's a series of briefs that the Society for Research and Child Development created last fall. And they really wanted to do these briefs on minoritized youth. And I was one of the authors for the addressing inequities in education for Black children and youth. And what we talk about is these systems and how there's built in inequity and what we can do to begin to unpack or remove those inequities. And so in terms of thinking about that, I've been involved in quite a few professional developments to go back to your question, how has that impacted my research? I've been involved in quite a few professional developments with teachers, both formal and informal, formal being those who teach in K through 12, traditional classrooms, informal being out-of-school time professionals, librarians, after-school professionals who work with Black young people to say, Here, here's what you need to know and learn about working with Black children. Here's what you need to know and learn about Black and with, working with Black children and their families, because working with Black children really means you need to also be working with their families. Don't just assume because a child is a latchkey kid or you don't see their parents often, that the parents don't care and they're not invested in their education. So a lot of my work now is dispelling those myths, myths, elevating the impact in case of thinking about the media of these immediate impressions that you then use to make general, general assumptions about Black children. So undoing that knowledge and that misinformation, 
pointing to resources um, that teachers and educators can use now, pointing to researchers, excuse me, resources, pointing to resources that parents can use to advocate for their children. So for example, there is the digital divide. Up until recently, you really only heard lots of conversation about the digital divide around rural communities. Believe it or not, there are quite a few rural communities that still have dial-ups, dial-up internet. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with dial-up internet, but it's not Files, it's not Comcast, it's not Cox. It's you dial through your phone to connect to the internet, which means that the data moves much slower. And so while everyone will say, go to the internet and create your account, go to the internet for virtual learning, you know, that was a conversation in agrarian and in, in, in rural spaces, but not as much of a conversation in urban spaces where people would say, oh, there's an internet hub at the library or there's an internet hub near your school or just go to the McDonald's or Burger King and use the free internet hub. But during COVID-19, where we were sheltering in place and education moved to an online platform, there was not an opportunity for those children, whether in the urban or rural environment, particularly Black children who are often living and urban environments or suburban environments to go to the internet hub at the library, to stay after school, to go to McDonald's or Burger King. So while we have moved into this virtual space, we need to address access to internet in order for those children to keep up with the learning. That's one basic practical issue to begin to think about as an example of moving from here's what the research says to this is what this looks like in a practical level and encouraging districts and encouraging local businesses to think about how do we support those families and those children so that they too can be connected to these virtual learning spaces that we now find most of ourselves in because of COVID-19. So it almost sounds like what you're saying, Valerie, and, and I've, and I've thought a little bit about this, right? That this, you know, the this lack of access or inequitable access to um, a resource like the internet, right? Wi-Fi, broadband, really, really isn't an, is an inequity in itself, right? And it almost is, it's almost like we should start, I feel like we should start treating um, the internet as water, Yes, I mean, absolutely. And 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 you you're not the only one who said that who said that and felt that way that it's considered an essential and should be considered an essential. And so you do have some again who were talking about, you know, advocating for open access, free internet access, everyone has the same speeds because there were, you know, some who were advocating for reduced speeds based on income. But again, that's a built-in inequity. You don't have the income level, so you can get a slower speed. But again, that means that you're not going to be able to complete your work and have access to work as a family who has an increased, um, a higher speed and more income and more resources to get that access. So as we've moved into this space, there has been more attention and foci on Internet as, like you said, as an essential, like water, electricity. There's been a conversation about that in some ways that's been muffled because of all of the other issues that we are facing as a country in this current time. But that definitely is a conversation that was elevated as soon as all the schools schools moved virtually and has come up again with a new school year and some schools going back to um, virtual, some schools doing a hybrid model. How do we make sure all the families have equal access? Because what that also means is that some children who don't have the access may be falling behind and may be penalized for that. So that's where the systemic issues come in. And in our brief, we really wanted to elevate like how you make these connections across different spheres that really impact how children learn and what they have access to. So Valerie, if we can go into that a little bit more, you know, as you mentioned, um, you um, co-authored um, a statement um, by the Society for Research and Child Development addressing inequities in, in education, considering considerations for Black children and youth in the era of COVID-19. And I'll definitely link this um, in the show notes. But if you could talk a little bit more and share maybe some, some of the recommendations from, from this brief. Sure. So 
a few colleagues and I, and I would be remiss to say that it was just me. It was a group of us really working hard together to think about, you know, what's most important, what's most salient, what do people need to learn, know, and understand about the Black experience in America, the Black child education experience, and the Black child education experience during COVID-19. So that brief literally is brief. It's only two very tight pages, but we try to do that. And so some of the things that we talk about in relation to sort of this internet example that I gave you is a need to increase investments in school infrastructure so that all schools, not just schools uh, with the higher tax base based on home ownership, and we could always talk about redlining that still exists, but um, that impacts the, you know, the tax dollars that fund school districts, but increasing investments in school infrastructure so that all students have equal access to remote learning at the same quality and level. So that means everyone has the same speed of internet if it's available. Everyone has access to the same books or eBooks or, or books that are sent home. They have the same kind of electronic devices. They have the same capacity across schools. So really investing in infrastructure so that school districts can serve children and focus on serving the children, not just on their own, but with support. Also making sure I, I talked about this and thinking about my move from being a practitioner to being a, an applied researcher and teachers and clinicians, school counselors, guidance counselors, they all need training on cultural relevant teaching. They all need to understand, you know, what what black families and children need to be supported. They also need to be trained on the technology that they'll be using to facilitate learning in these virtual spaces, right? Um, they also need to think about adapting curriculum so that it meets the needs of children, particularly if you find that you're in a district where even if the whole district has access to a particular speed, but it, it is in a high speed, then perhaps you're gonna need to make curriculum modifications that still meet the learning needs and goals of the district or the, or the state, but are aligned with what you have resources, what resources are available in that district. Thinking about interactive instruction, how do you facilitate online evaluation and assessment? Are those assessments going to be different than what they have been? Um, so those are some things to think about. We also think about, you know, again, can districts support professional development that helps teachers and the others that serve them to be responsive to the needs of Black children, their academic needs, their emotional needs, you know, the need for stability, understanding how the pandemic may affect their family. We know that the pandemic is disproportionately affecting Black families, which they very well mean. And we also know that, you know, you know, learning at home, staying at home, sheltering in place means that there could be someone in that household who has COVID, right? And, and they're in that house and they may not live in a sprawling house where that, that, that family member can self-isolate. So they could be dealing with an actual COVID case at home. You know, I know of at least two families who, and one, and one is a student of mine who's the family, you know, pretty much lived at home together and sheltered in place, but they have family members who tend to work in what's considered essential work. So they can't work remotely from home. They don't have that privilege. And so what happens? A family member gets COVID, they all get COVID. So also understanding that when you're having these expectations that the child is going to be in front of the computer or all their work is going to be turned in in a timely fashion because we're now virtual and at home. So really understanding, you know, and making adjustments to the learning expectations, being interactive in your learning, and what does it mean to be a part of a population that has a higher level of COVID-19, right, in the community. Thinking about tutoring options, really thinking through this, and not just from the K through 12 level, but K through 16. College students are young adults. Sometimes I like to call them late stage adolescents, but young adults. So they too often are going back home or checking in with their family members. You know, I know Jackie, you also have a college student. So what does it mean to have a student who's living on campus and may need to come home? So those are some of the recommendations that, that we, you know, talk about. We also even talk about, you know, food security. You know, how mm -hmm. do we ensure that 
food security happening, particularly if you are in a district where many of the kids are getting free or reduced price lunch and sometimes breakfast. Now they're sheltering in place. What are we doing to make sure that they're getting decent meals every day? So those are some of the recommendations, uh, which aren't necessarily new minus the COVID, but they've been elevated. And because COVID has disrupted let me say that again, COVID has disrupted the economic infrastructure of our country and caused some additional stressors on lower income families. We do have to think about what implications that economic disruption has on a child's ability to eat, to concentrate, and to have access to learning resources while they're sheltering in place at home. Well, I, I to totally agree. And I think, um, you know, one one great thing that the an additional point that the brief talks about was the ele the experiencing elevated levels of stress. Right. So, yes. you know, and how and, and again, how everything really connects. Right. There's this intersectionality for everything, um, creating almost like an added weight on family. So I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, you know, given your your background also in psychology also about the elevated levels of stress and also potential recommendations for how school systems can support families that, that are experiencing, and I guess even staff as well, right? Because I mean, it's it's not just the families, right? I, I know teachers, educators, they're doing their best given the circumstances, and they're also experiencing, you know, tons of stress. I know my colleagues as well, your colleagues as well, right? Doing the work that you're doing, it's stressful. Absolutely. And thanks for that nudge and reminding me. So let me just say a few things. I am a college professor. <laughs> so I teach these late stage adolescents, adolescents, young people that I'm just describing. I'm also a mother of a four year old who is now doing virtual pre-K. So the stress is very real in trying to present your best self for those that you serve if you're in a service position, but also attending to the needs of your children or others who depend on you and yourself. So, you know, the term self-care is not new. It had kind of become, you know, a hot word, a fancy word um, that folks were using. Make sure, you're, you know, you're practicing self-care, but now more than ever, it's important to find those things that mean something to you. So in creating the brief, we were really sort of thinking from a nested model approach, an ecological approach where we talk about economic impact, um, mental and physical health impact, food structure, supporting the, the parents as well as the children, all of those things coming together and policies, national policies, state policies, local policies. So when we're thinking about stress, um, what is it that Teachers can include when we're talking about curriculum modifications. Can you include more breaks? Right? Can you give more breaks from screen time? Because prior to this virtual online instruction, much of the communication literature and research often coming out of Annenberg Schools of Communication, there's one at Penn, where they talked about limiting screen time for young people. Right. And, and when you uh, for children, especially early children, thinking about a pre-K child and then for adolescents, you know, that. They're spending too much time on screens. At that time, we were thinking about them watching television and social media. So, you know, that was a big issue. And that was the research saying we need to limit the screen time. It's disrupting the sleep. It's changing the cortisol levels. They're not getting enough physical activity. So now they're doing that. Children are doing their, their virtual screen time on top of virtual learning. So one thing to think about in terms of reducing stress for both the students, teachers, and parents are reducing the amount of time that we have to spend in time in front of screens. Not just saying we're gonna move from face-to-face -face instruction and do the same thing on screens, including in your screen time, breaks for walking away from the screen or doing a fun activity. So for example, in one of my classes, I used to do this when we met face-to-face -face and they were doing in-class work. I said, let's create some playlists. So when you're doing in-class work, we have music you like in the background. It just has to be PG. We can't have any profane, profane versions. So in my class, when we're getting ready for Zoom, right before class, I just play music. And then I said, give me recommendations. So when we have breaks, we play music that the students enjoy. So thinking about that from a teaching perspective, is there like a, a small funny clip or something that the students can agree with? Can you play a game that takes away from the traditional instruction that's driven by sort of testing scores and things like that? Can you say, 
go off the screen, do some journal time or some doodle time, and then come back on screen. For ourselves, what makes you feel better? As teachers, as parents, what is it that you do that makes you feel better? Because if you can make sure you do some of that every day, then that will help to reduce the stress. Under the current extreme chronic stress that has come with COVID-19, I can't necessarily say I'm, you know, that we're going to feel 100% better or immediately better the way we might have felt pre-COVID-19 where we do these things that are part of our self-care regimen. But I can say that when we do these things, that they do help. So for me, one of the things that I say um, in my emails and in my communication and when I sign off on webinars is make sure every day that you be safe, whatever safety means for you. So if that means that you're protesting, are you wearing a mask? Are you social distancing? If that means that you're staying home and being careful, just be safe, whatever that means to you. Make sure that you laugh. And you dance every day. We know, we know, and you, you are a medical doctor, that when we laugh, when we dance, we're releasing energy. We, we know that our endorphins are increasing. And that contributes to health. That contributes to better mental and physical health. So whatever that looks like for you, whatever your dance is, you know, whatever, your, whatever, your, whatever makes you laugh that's not harmful to you, do those things every day. So if we can't do anything, what's our one thing that brings us joy? that brings us happiness that we can do every day as individuals and make sure you do that every day and remind yourself to do that every day. As teachers and parents, what are the things that bring the students joy? Make sure we integrate that into our day. Oh, I think that's, that's it. Again, when we first started talking, you know, I say that I'm also a learner in these conversations that I have with like wonderful, wonderful guests like you. And I think, oh, that joy, right? Just remembering that and that those taking those moments um, throughout the day. So I think that, I mean, I think that's an additional great pointer, right? That would probably be added, you know, in the second version of the brief. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, when we have two more pages, we can, we can add that. I can say it was, it was a pleasure to write this brief with my colleagues, Noni Gaylord, you know, Judith Scott, I have to mention them, Eleanor Seaton, Joanna Williams, Aaron Bogan, um, Lori Francis, we really struggle with what do we keep for our two pages? What's most salient for people who are thinking about how best to serve Black children and families um, from an educational perspective? But it was also a joy to think about, you know, this is going to help prayerfully and hopefully this is going to, you know, hopefully that this brief being as tight and concise as it is will help people to make decisions because what COVID-19 has forced us to do, it's elevated the inequities and disparities, and it's also forced people into action. It's forced school districts into action. It's forced employers into actions. It's forced parents to rethink. So it's forced everyone into action. And for those who are not used to thinking about this from a systemic perspective, so for a parent, you're like, I'm just trying to make sure my child does well does well in school, I can go to work, I can put food on a table. So you may not have been thinking, wow, it's not just me, it's all or many Black parents or many Black families. So in our brief, we're thinking, can you go with these recommendations and do something now? And so that was part of our, our goal was, can you read this brief, be educated, and then pick one of these recommendations and do something now? So you know, we hope that in doing some of those things in this first brief, as you mentioned, that it will relieve some of the stress of making decisions for those who are in positions like principals or school district boards who have to make decisions. So hopefully we can relieve some of that decision making stress, uh, if you will, in terms of you have to do something now. Here are some things that you can do. We've set it up so you don't have to think about it. Oh, yeah, I think. Yeah, this is this is like a one on one um, guide to how 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 school districts, families, communities. Right. Because, again, again, this, you know, this intersectionality and, and you kind of touch on multiple things, the economics, uh, um, community, parents, curriculum, all those all those things kind of are are important. You can talk about the importance of um, taxes. Right. So. That's economic economics, and also, um, as well as how do we rethink, you know, over policing in schools, right? So, I mean, so 
and and that I know that's a that's a topic for another day, and I'm definitely going to follow up with that topic, and I'll probably give you a call again to to delve more into that because of your background with education. But given given the work that you've done and you're doing now, and reflecting on um the great work that you and your colleagues did on this brief, have you have you really had time to think about what how we could reimagine right? I mean, there are tips now that I think are that are important for us to kind of get through COVID. But if we get, we get, you know, I'll just put it out there, right? We get through COVID. What do you, what do you reimagine um, educational system looking like for kids? Yes. Um, that's a good question. And um, it's not a good answer. So let me start again. <laughs> that is a very good question, Jackie. And for me, I reimagine education. The term that we use now as hybrid I reimagine education being multifaceted so that different families and different learners can get what they need and that that becomes the norm versus the exception for public schools, not just private schools, not just independent schools, not just parochial schools, not just lab schools where researchers like myself do our research and say, let's try this for a select few students. But this hybrid model, these different methodologies that we're using to educate children and to connect with families become the norm. That's what I reimagine. I that's what I imagine will be a would be, and what I would like to see, because I don't think that there is necessarily, the way our society is structured, that there's necessarily one best system, a method of educating young people, and that if we are appreciative of that, then we have multi methods, right? Multi methods of educating young people where they're all getting what they need and they're all learning and flourishing, which means that some students may go into the class three days a week and two days a week, they're at a community center because perhaps families are back at work, but we know that there are some school districts now where they're learning hubs. So like the Y in Charlottesville have these learning hubs where for parents who work out of the home, they're central workers and their kids are, or their children, should I say. So for parents who are essential workers and work outside of the home, the YMCA in the Charlottesville community is serving as an educational hub where groups of children can go the same group. So you reduce the chance of too many people and, and hopefully no, uh, reduce the chance of spreading COVID, they can go and do their learning in that space. So maybe post COVID, that's one educational model in some communities where kids go, children go to school a couple days a week, and then other days they hub for college students. Outside of the United States, the gap year is common. When we do it here, people are like, oh, are you sure you want to do that? We do know our kids. So you know if you have the kind of kid who know my child needs to go straight through or they won't go. But in other other countries where I have lived and read about, for example, living in Namibia and also definitely living in South Africa, the gap year is common. And by the time the student comes to college the next year, they've had so much rich lived experience away from academia that they flourish in college. So perhaps the gap year becomes more common. Right. And we don't penalize students who take a gap year. We don't take away any scholarships that they received. You know, perhaps standardized testing, which has always been critiqued for the cultural bias and the questioning on um, the way students are prepared for it. But perhaps the kind of standardized testing we see is dissolved or diversified. But I definitely feel that post covid we want to see a multifaceted approach to public education that's supported locally and nationally. That's what I would like to see. Uh, I think about in terms of your question of my research, I've been working with the Pennsylvania Humanities Council in Pennsylvania, who has this teen reading lounge. And this connects back to my early work in out-of-school time programming. And so initially, it was really a book club for teenagers serving predominantly white libraries in predominantly white middle-class communities. But as they began to look at the demographic, demo, demographic shifts, so as PHC began to look at and study the demographic shifts of children and families across all of the counties in Pennsylvania, not just the Philadelphia metro county where it is located, they began to see more diversity, 
if it wasn't racial and ethnic diversity, it was certainly income diversity. Every county in Pennsylvania has low income youth, even if it's relatively racially homogenous. And so as an organization, this is the kind of change I'd love to see more, more school districts and other youth serving and children serving organizations do post COVID committed to serving the children and families who needed, who needed it most. And their commitment meant that they began to serve children who lived in Philadelphia. They began to serve children who lived in the county surrounding Philadelphia. It also meant that the Pennsylvania Humanities Council, PHC, began to provide culturally relevant, culturally rich professional development for the out-of-school time professionals and librarians, teen librarians who were working directly with the young people coming into their libraries. So that when the young people who may not have traditionally been involved in the teen reading lounge, so they were black, they were brown, they were LBTQI, they were low income white children, they weren't used to being welcomed or they just didn't have the time because of commitments at home or because they didn't have the transportation that those librarians and those coordinators could serve had the competence or at least the knowledge base to serve those children better and well. They also increased the authors and diversity of books on the list. So instead of it just being a list of Harry Potter books, there were books by Sharon Draper and Sharon Flake. You know, there were other books, The Hate You Give made the list, you know, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson made the list. Whereas before, the list was not culturally inclusive, the list of books. It began to look more like a youth-driven program. So it would be great post-COVID for school districts and out-of-school time organizations to commit to a different model and commit to being more culturally inclusive, which means providing the professional development support that teachers and educators need to work with children in communities and embedding in their educational model or their out-of-school time programming flexibility and how you serve the young people. Because oftentimes, just like school, you know, out-of-school time programs will say, particularly if they are funded by 21st century learning center funding, and this goes back to policy because that policy is set by the federal government and then the state governments across the state who take that funding have to follow that policy. If there's not a certain amount of dosage, meaning if children don't come for a certain amount of time to that out-of-school time programming, the program loses their funding. That doesn't take into consideration young people who may have to go home because of transportation issues or because they help with a family member, or because they're babysitting a sibling. So why are you penalizing them for the challenges they have? So I do feel like post-COVID should be more inclusive of the different family structures. Everyone doesn't have a two-parent, two-car, two-kid home life experience. The nuclear family looks different. Communities look different. So schools need to look different but serve and have high expectations for the children that they are serving. Thank you so much, Valerie. That I think that's I think that's a wonderful, a wonderful reimagining. And I just just pray that this occurs. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I do pray that this occurs. And I mean, I, I think there are two things that I want to additional things I want to share related but indirectly to the brief. So So one thing that I want to share, and I I haven't talked as much about this, but this does relate to my research and something that I've been beginning to talk more about in both my classes and, and and thinking about collecting or looking at this more specifically. When we think about education and the television shows and movies that we see that include Black children and families, most of them show Black children and families, particularly children, devaluing educational experiences. Mm -hmm. Right. So we don't see them as the whiz kid, as the guru, as the smart kid, as invested in their college experience, invested in their education. Maybe we can think a little bit about grownish. We can think about blackish. We can think about a different world. If we go back, we can think about the Cosby show. But generally speaking, most shows that include black teenagers and youth 
Like if we think about the Proud family, a cartoon, but nevertheless, if we think about the PJs, we think about these images of Black children and teens as devaluing education, as not interested in learning. We know that 75% of the teachers who educate Black children are white women. We know that many of our communities are segregated, meaning that there isn't a lot of cross-racial or ethnic uh, experiences and exchanges in the communities where we live. And so if most of what you're seeing demonstrates that Black children and youth are not interested in education, are you interpreting or applying what you're seeing on television to how you engage with black children in the classroom, right? Are you doing that? And we have a chapter coming out, um, Teaching Beautiful Brilliant Black Girls. It's a book coming out any day now. And it's for teachers, it's for white women who teach black girls. And in my chapter, I talk about that. I talk about how, you know, in an attempt to make relationships, and I've seen this, with and, and get along well with the children that they serve, some teachers will placate the children or they will adopt language that they've seen on a video or a movie to relate to Black children. But in some ways, that's superficial. So can you go beyond that? So if it, And it, it doesn't mean that you don't want to know what they're listening to or watching. I'm not saying that teachers shouldn't do that. I'm saying that you have to do more than just know which Black artists are on the top 40. You have to know more than Cardi B's new lyrics to Cardi B's new song. Can you have a conversation with your Black adolescent girls, not just about Cardi B's lyrics and rap them or do her dance moves if you choose to do that, but can you have a conversation with Black girls about body image? Can you have a conversation with Black girls about sex and sexuality? Can you have those conversations? And as teens, particularly teens I'm talking about now, they may be dismissive, but can you at least instigate a critical thought process with them in addition to being aware of the pop culture um, and commodification of Black women and women of color or Black men and men of color? So yes, you can relate and students are always impressed when as a teacher or a professor, you can relate to what they're watching or what they're listening to. But can you go beyond that to help them be critical about what they're consuming? Because unfortunately, a lot of those media images are what are how is how they're perceived in their day to day lived experiences. So, yes, you want to be able to relate to your students. And I talk about that in my chapter, especially as it relates to media images. But you also want to move beyond those superficial media images. Can you integrate that into a lesson, the lyrics to a song? Can you help them to be critical about what they're consuming or just give them the space? Sometimes young people, if you give them the space, they will say, sure, I love this about Jay-Z or Cardi B or Beyonce. But I also have this issue. And that's one of the things I talk about in my chapter. I talk about, you know, the love for Lil Wayne, but then the backlash because of his, you know, statements about his colorism statements about preferring uh, a particular type and color of black woman if he preferred black women at all. So yes, they can appreciate and like his music, but they can also critique him as an artist. So as non-black educators working with black children, black girls, black boys, absolutely. You want to know what they're watching. You want to know what they're listening to, but you also want to go beyond that superficial and be able to have conversations or figure out how to integrate that into your culture, that culture into your curriculum without being, you know, offensive. And so that means that you have work to do as a teacher, you have work to do as a clinician, but it's possible and and necessary to do right by the, by black children. I love these conversations and learn so much. COVID-19 has disrupted education and that's quite an understatement. We've learned that normal and education won't work moving forward. Ali and Valerie not only shared their knowledge but opportunities to move forward to address educational equity. We'll revisit conversations about the educational system in an upcoming episode. And I'll also put links to both Elias Wavy and Dr. Valerie Adams Bass on the podcast page of whatisblack.co so you can follow them and learn more about their work.
Well, that's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening. I'm so grateful for your support and community. What is Black is hosted by Dr. Jacqueline Duget. Music and editing by Manny Simone. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. And if you happen to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. If you want to stay up to date about what's coming up this season, sign up for our newsletter at whatisblack.co.